Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Afternoon uh, for Europeans. Uh, this is our fifth Ford 44 call. Lots to cover today. Um, as always, a bunch of spec updates. Um, then uh, I think it's probably worth spending some time chatting about uh, this large block testing that we've been doing. Uh, Georgios has managed to send a few rounds of uh, large transactions on Gordy, and so we can chat about what we want to see next there. Um, chat about DevNet 3, how that's going. Uh, we were supposed to be launching next week, so are we still feeling like that's possible? And then um, I think last, if, if we have time, um, uh, I know uh, we're right in the middle of discussing Shanghai inclusions and whatnot right now. So um, it would be good to just make sure the readiness checklist is, is roughly up to date and, and um, yeah, just discuss uh, how people feel about Shanghai. Um, but yes, uh, to start, I think the first thing uh, spec wise was um, what to do for uh, blocks which have no blobs. Uh, George had, uh, oh, Kev, sorry, had a PR uh, about this uh, PR 3093 in the CL specs. Um, Kev, do you want to maybe just give us a, a quick recap of where things are at there? Uh, hello. Yeah. So um, currently, I think we've all agreed on the strategy in the PR, and it's uh, we just need to know if clients actually are going to incorporate optional sidecars. Um, if I remember correctly, George, I think even if they don't, we might still go through with this PR. Yeah, uh, hey, Kev, I think that's indeed the case. So uh, I think like a bit of background is that uh, there were some bugs that appeared when uh, an empty sidecar was given to the cryptography layer. And we know how to fix the bug. and. Uh, the fixes will get incorporated regardless of whether the sidecar becomes optional or not. But um, I just want to, 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 to understand why uh, the sidecar is not optional when there are no blob transactions. If this is something we did, uh, if this is a good thing, maybe because it doesn't have any special blocks, like any if else condition, and you know, if that's the case, uh, if if the sidecar becomes optional, then it means that we can be sure that anything given to the cryptography layer will have at least, you know, like uh, one commitment and one blob. And this might let us do a bit more defensive, you know, like have a bit more invariance in the code. But uh, the cryptography PR will not be affected too much. I was just wondering what's the rationale behind the sidecars not being optional. I mean, I would ask why make the sidecars optional? You know, they're otherwise, if you make the sidecars optional, you're going to have a bunch of places like in the networking spec where you're like, well, if you have a sidecar, do this. Whereas, you know, you have you have two messages, it's easy to send two messages and one message will be empty if the commitments are empty in the other message. I, I, I you know, I think I guess you end up having some logic hoisted somewhere to handle emptiness, but if you're going to put that in the cryptography layer, regardless, then I'd say it's actually easier to have sidecars with everything. Okay, that, that makes there's, sense. I mean, there's another there's another uh -huh. argument, which is currently the data availability check is is there a sidecar for this block, and does it validate? Um, and in your case, we would have to make that logic also something like. Uh, does this block have any blobs? And if yes, is there a sidecar? And if no, yeah, don't do anything. Yeah. So like, I mean, also not a huge difference, but we would have. To yeah, but it's that. pretty much like it. It just rather than just hey, given the commitments and given the sidecar, does it validate? It becomes it's, you end up with preconditions to kind of even get into that logic. Yeah, I okay. I think I mean I think it makes perfect sense definitely to program it so that we can have empty ones. And we can then still like have a discussion later on if for some reason it seems easier to like make it optional. But as long as it's small, I think there's not really a strong reason for that. Sounds good. Um, uh, uh -huh. Sorry. So my take is I would prefer to, for emptiness and 
don't do optional unless we have to, just because when you do optional, there's also additional complexity to implement for the module and the uh, module layer. And uh, yeah, it it just like it just like a one more thing that could go around there. So that's just my preference. Okay, that that, that makes sense. I mean, I was uh, thinking that like you know, I'm not sure if we're going with a decoupled blo uh, block side cast thing or not. But I was thinking that like if it's decoupled, maybe it allows block verification to go through faster. But um, I think we have good consensus here, and. That, that, that we don't do optional and it's mandatory and empty. And in this case, uh, things can get the cryptography PR uh, merit uh, like probably tomorrow, early tomorrow. Nice. Okay, anything uh, else on, a, on, oh, sorry, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, yeah, Tim, there is another PR that got merit uh, just as an update. Uh, I think it's 3097. Uh, which basically, um, uh, what it does is it makes the verify KZG proof interface be a bit more high level. So like accept bytes and not field elements. These uh, remove some burden from the client devs when they're implementing the pre-compile. Um, we did that uh, from feedback by Alexei. Uh, and 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 there is a another PR on the IT side which like simplifies the the precompile to use this new interface. So that's good. Um, Roberto suggested that maybe we do the precompile interface of the KCG library even more high level and incorporate also the hash check. Uh, we didn't do that in this PR, but as more clients uh, implement this thing. And as we get more feedback on what's the right interface, we might want to um, revamp the interface if needed. So yeah, uh, let us know if you have feedback on the cryptography API. Other than that, uh, I think we're at a good state right now. But did this 3097 that was in the um, spec release on Friday, right? I, I, it was it, maybe. I'm not I sure. I believe it was. Let me just confirm. Yeah, I think so. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? It's just context for implementers if they're targeting this release. It it is out. It is in there. Yes. As was the validate blob sidecar gossip condition, a number of other things. Okay, anything else on either the empty blobs or uh, updates on the KCG side? Uh, we, we had a question on the KCG library. Uh, right now, the field elements per blob uh, is sort of hard coded in the C KCG library. And uh, like for the minimal spec in on the continuous layer side, we have like a different value than what is hard coded there. So maybe we want to make that like a variable rather than have it as a constant in the CKZG library itself. Uh, what is hard coded exactly? Uh, the field elements per blob, it is uh, hard coded as 4096. And the minimal uh, preset for the consensus spec that value is set as four. So like, I think it might be better to sort of have that value configurable. Like if also if we want to sort of say uh, benchmark uh, different values of uh, field elements per blob or something like uh -huh. that. I see, I see what you mean. So you, you want this to be configurable on the CKZG side, like a, make it, um... A compile time parameter or something. Yeah, something like that. Because right now, uh, like the trusted setup uh, uh, parameters also checks that whatever you get from the file is equal to the hard coded parameter in the CKZ. So, like if you pass it 
anything which is not 4096, it might, uh, it will basically crash sort of because there's an assert in the load trusted setup thing. Okay. All right. That, that, I think that makes sense. I mean, we do want these to be a smaller value in the minimal preset. So the library should support that. So I guess I will, uh, I think Ramana is not in this call uh, for whatever reason. So I can uh, let him know that we want fields for whatever the constant be called to be parameterizable. Okay, that, that, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, one more thing, like uh, we were thinking about uh, when we uh, when we batch verify uh, a range of blocks, we also sort of want to do the same thing for blocks. Like right now in Lighthouse, we uh, batch PLS verifies 64 uh, signatures for 64 blocks at the same time. So uh, like on the KCG uh, verify aggregated KCG proof side, would it be as simple as uh, just adding up uh, like the indivi individual blob arrays from each uh, block uh, blob side card that we get and adding all the individual KCG proofs and then just passing it to the KCG library as is or would that be something different like would we have to do something additional on top of that? Um, oh, I, I was thinking of what Proto wrote in the comments but what uh, let's let's touch this second uh, question what 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 are you saying exactly you want to do more things out of the crypto layer before you pass it into the crypto layer or what uh, um, did you say i think he's saying that uh, currently we have this verify function that works for one block and uh, he wants the verify function to sort of work for multiple blocks so you do like a batch verification that, that would be faster uh, right like, because you have only you would need to compute just one pairing. I guess I'm, I'm not. I'm not really sure. That. Where would this be used? Uh, like get uh, when we sync basically on the consensus layer side, we get a range of blocks right now. So presumably we would be doing the same for blocks and blobs with the blocks and blobs by range method, and we get I like see. 64 blobs at once. And instead of passing like it one by one, we want to pass it like batched, basically. I see. So this could be like a helper only used during sync, right? Yeah, sort of. That's right. Okay. Uh, and and you have found that this is a like the speed that during sync is an issue that would benefit from such a aggregate batch verification. Uh, like uh, we haven't really tried it yet, but uh, the thing is that we do the same for uh, batch verifying BLS signatures that we right now in like the current mainnet. Whenever we get blocks, we batch verify all the proposal signatures and the aggregate attestation signatures and stuff like that. So I thought that it would like be similarly faster if we do it in a batch instead of doing it one by one. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it, it, it's definitely possible. I'm just wondering, like Roberto said, if it should be part of the library or it should be. Um, okay, maybe we can take this offline so that we don't hold the meeting. But I, I, I agree that if it's taking you considerable time to sync, uh, we could do some sort of batch verification to to speed it up. Sure. I mean, we actually used to have one before we, we, we introduced the KCG proof technique a few like many months ago, we used to do batch verification. So it shouldn't be too hard to bring it back on. Um, uh, uh, on your first comment, uh, Proto said uh, whether uh, it's worth making the field thing parameterizable or just keeping it 4096 for all the presets. I, I don't have an opinion on this, but if you think that's a good idea, we could also do that. Proto? I, I think it's more Xiao Wei's domain because uh, Powen was talking about the minimal specs having a smaller trusted setup than the mainnet specs. Uh, we 
yes, I think we can do that, but just using the long uh, larger trusted staff is also slower um, in Python implementations. Uh, that's what I saw of from the basic uh, PyTest, but um, so we haven't generated um, lot, uh, many block verification tests uh, so far, just some like uh, maybe only four or five basic tests. Um, so I, I will need to um, try if we can do so uh, in the CI test with that uh, with the mainnet set up for the, the um, CI usage. So uh, I will try something locally and report it back later. Thanks. Okay. I mean, I can see how 4096 will be quite slow in Python, um, <clears throat> but uh, may, and especially as we add more tests, it will like get slower and slower. <clears throat> but um, I mean, do the test, shall we? And if it's indeed quite much slower, we can also talk with Ramana and see. I don't, I don't expect that it would be that much hard to make it a compile time configurable thing. Uh, if you use some sort of build system. So uh, I think it's, we, we can do it that way, but I can ask Ramana to see what he thinks. Okay, anything else on this? Okay, the other open one, Terence, you had this issue about ancestor blob availability check uh, that you opened a while back and um, still is, it's been sort of pending. Um, anything there you think we, we should discuss now? Um, I think from the issue, there seems like to be a good consensus on just like we should do cannot import, meaning that if we don't have the blobs, uh, ancestors that's up to 19, 18 days, you cannot import the sub, sub, subsequent blob. And I think that just, I think the rationale is, um, it is like easier to um, rational, rationalize because like when you do optimistic thinking, you only do this for thinking part, but we don't need to think here. So there's no point import it optimistically. So I think the next step is just to like um, look at the spec and then uh, and then further clarify it. So I'm not sure the spec today states cannot import or states can import, but import optimistically. So that's just something to check the spec for. And I don't think this is like a blocker for like DeathNet 3, for example, but yes, it will be good to uh, clarify that in the spec. Got it. Okay. Any comments on that? Um, okay, sweet. Next, uh, Ansgar, you had some spec updates as well. The first one uh, on the minimum gas price for blobs, uh, you seem to have moved to saying we should just uh, just use one way and, and uh, basically go with that. Any objections or, or, or thoughts there? Okay, so let's. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I'm I'm still of track. the I'm still of the opinion that it's better to be opinionated here because there's no reason to impose the cost of the network if there's no economic benefit. It's well, it's not a sustained cost, right? It's like can the network handle this load and it becomes kind of constant over some unit time rather than say building out you know, expanding the blockchain or the state forever. So I don't see it quite as like that. We either should be able to handle that load or not. And I don't see it as like kind of a, it is an increased fixed cost rather than like an increased sustained cost. So I, I'm not too worried about it. So I guess, I don't know, does it, 
just in like the spirit of trying to get this back to a spot where like it's 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 pretty much finalized like do we just leave Ensgar's PR open launch the devnets and I don't know if later we want to have this argument we can but like and maybe I don't know once like all the client teams have started implementing it there'll be more to discuss but I think for now just to, to move quicker I'd be inclined to leave it at one and um, see if that yeah see if there's like strong objections there beyond thank rad I'll take this as a yes. Um, okay, and you had three merge PR as guards. Do you want to give a, a quick update on, on each of them? So I think the modulus one is probably the both, the biggest Wait, like concrete brief, change. Brief, did, yeah. Did, did we just say to close or to leave the PR open? I, I wasn't so. Um, so so the sorry yeah actually that wasn't clear. Uh, the I mean I I don't. So the spec right now uses the value one right. Right. My preference would be to close the PR. I think we sometimes make the mistake of just trying to basically not make decisions until very late. And then that always just adds kind of uncertainty for people involved. I think given how people, how much people disagree here and that one leaving it at one for minute launch is not an issue in any way, I would prefer to revisit this for the fog after and um, just have it in a place where we don't have to worry about it for now anymore. But I mean, if people okay. really prefer to leave it open, I'm fine. Fine with that as well. No, I, I think we should just close it, and we can always find it on GitHub if we if we want it. It's not like it's a complex like PR either. Um, so if we want to refer back to the conversation, it'll still be there. Um. Yeah, so that's, yeah, let's close that one. Do you want to give a quick update on the three other ones? Uh, so the, the modulus, uh, the transaction block broadcast and the, the fork behavior? Sure, so basically the idea was to, by this call, have all, all the kind of spec updates done. And so they, all, all these PRs are merged. Um, so the, the one was, uh, we talked about in the past, the, the, the pre-compile return values, we ended up um, deciding to pad the degree value after all, so that it's also 32 bytes. Um, the extra cost is so small, and just in case um, there, there are some incompatibilities, so, so it's, it's just easier to do that, so that's, so that's merged. Um, and then we have the, um, the uh, mempool behavior clarification, specifically now the spec requires clients to not auto-broadcast for it for four um, transactions. There was a small question last, last week, whether this should just be a recommendation or a, um, a mandatory um, requirement. And Marius pointed out that if you actually want to be able to restrict your own kind of bandwidth um, and 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 um, the, just the amount of incoming for for transactions, basically it is necessary that you can actually kick peers uh, that that flood you with for for four transactions. So it has to be a spec violation to do that. So 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 that's why. Um, the spec now makes it mandatory that you no longer you, you, that, that you just don't broadcast um, incoming uh, block transactions. You only announce them, um, and then with the uh, ETH uh, sixty eight um, the, the, the upcoming ETH sixty eight um, uh, version, uh, you'll actually as part of the announcement also announce the transaction type and the size, so that uh, clients can make a more informed choice whether or not to 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 request the transactions from you. It'll make um, transaction propagation slightly. Uh, slower but that but that's fine um so that's that's merged um and then the uh one second the third one is uh ah that was just a like a really small um small one it should should be common sense but just uh the spec didn't didn't actually clarify uh, the behavior at the fork block itself specifically because um Part of the of the of the of the basically base fee calculation is the the the, the parent header fields uh, with the excess uh, gas, but that of course doesn't exist at the fork block, so it's just now explicitly initialized at zero, at the at the fork height. Um, but yeah, it should should be common sense. I assume that's how people already implemented it. Um, that's all. So then, from my side, basically, I don't see any. I don't have any any kind of future spec updates that are still missing. It's like from my side, the spec is basically in a in a. Okay. Good place. Awesome.
Um, okay, Danny, I just saw your comments. Do you want to take maybe a couple minutes and walk through uh, your doc or just like kind of a brain dump? Uh, my, yeah. Let's... What What you think we want out of this, basically? Um, and then we can probably go from there. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the, the big thing that we want to see is, is how much at different data sizes under a reasonable amount of burst, so five or 10 blocks um, sustained, that the chain and nodes continue to function as, as expected. You know, in, in previous minor experiments, we just had the orphan rate, um, but we now have a lot more data on chain. So we first and foremost kind of want to look at the orphan rate. We want to look at um, attestation inclusion and success rates, which become an indicator of um, how well validators are performing, which are nodes of quite a diverse type. Um, and then we also want to understand if uh, any degradation of that chain data is um, kind of random as to which validators are de degrade, uh, degrading depending on the, the slot or if it's a particular set. So maybe we see that 10% of validators are always kind of performing poorly at some data load size, um, which would indicate, you know, at some bandwidth or uh, hardware, some sort of um, threshold, there, there's beginning to be issues. Um, and then additionally, we have the PRISM sentry nodes. It would be good to have uh, some other node type because we might have asymmetries on how PRISM performs uh, or is connected in the graph versus others. But these sentry nodes are going to dump um, first arrival time of various messages, so blocks, attestations, and aggregates. Um, these, this will give us like additional network data as to how um, how these these messages are being propagated. So you could imagine, you know, some re low resource node in say Australia actually gets blocks like nine seconds late, um, but most most validators maybe aren't of that type. So sentry nodes kind of complement the chain data. Um, it'd be good to have a diversity in region and good to have a diversity in um, the requirements that they're they're facilitated with. Um, Really what we're looking for is we want to know the norm on all of this and we want to know deviation from the norm. And then we want to understand deviation from the norm with respect to some of our key um, thresholds, key timing thresholds. So, you know, call it when things are deviating um, towards arrival times in like the three second mark, then we're kind of entering into the danger zone. So we want to understand, we want to do this on test nets. Uh, we don't expect crazy things to break on test nets, but if they do, that's a sign. Um, and then we want to carry forward, you know, whatever the successful data thresholds were on test nets, we want to go to um, mainnet and observe this data. Uh, I think ultimately what we want to do is pick a number that functioned very happily on mainnet and maybe lower than that, uh, given other simulation and pen and paper analysis, uh, so that we're certainly in kind of a safe zone as we initially launched 4844. I do have to run. Uh, talk to you all soon. Catch up with you all. Bye. Maybe, maybe picking up from where Danny left off. Um, if these are our goals, the current status quo is that we have a very simple script which submits a bunch of 128 kilobyte transactions. No weird behavior was observed, but 128 kilobyte is not expected to do anything, I would say. So right now, um, I'm going to connect with Flashbots today, probably on getting a builder, which has a bigger limit, and going to start spamming 520 and 1024 kilobyte transactions. Um, yeah. Nice. Yeah, I think, I think that's useful. And I think if we can get even like, a, like even the 128 transactions, like I believe you managed to get 11 in a single block at the same time. So like, if we yeah, spam it, about be, we, so we are going to be submitting full block templates via the builder. Yeah. So we're going to be eating up the entire block. And so far, the biggest one that we have gotten is like 11, 11 128 kilobyte transactions, 2 million gas each. Um, and that I think probably was the biggest block for Gurley. Um, yeah. Happy to refine in any way that people think is relevant. Yes. Um, Terrence? Um, yeah, so I guess I have a question for um, the consensus layer client teams here, like Lighthouse, Tenku, and um, Lowstar, and Nimbus. Do you guys capture um, attestation arrival latency in 
I guess probably not like in the DB, right? But do you capture that in like the matrix form, for example, like histogram? Yes, we do. Okay, that's perfect. So um, yeah, so if you guys do, then Perry and the DevOps team can also launch you guys as, as that century node. So the more, the better. I think Lighthouse does and Nimbus does too. Nice. Yeah, we yeah. do. Nice. Um, and I guess, is it uh, realistic to expect uh, the builder to be up and running like in the next day or two? I think it would be really neat if before all core devs Thursday, we could have had, you know, a couple. Yeah, um, yeah. the builder exists, it's set yeah. up, and I should have it today. Is my, like, that's what I've been told. My, I've been told that I okay. should have it today. Amazing. So if I have okay. it today, Great. we'll get done today. If not, <laughs> okay, and I guess then the thing we need to make sure is we have some sentry nodes up and running like today or tomorrow. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll I'll follow up in the in in the Telegram chat about this, but um, yeah, and maybe uh, one thing that would be helpful. Uh, so uh, uh, Lighthouse and, and Lodestar, you mentioned you have all these metrics. Uh, do you mind sharing like just your docs page or like? Uh, Say we're sending this to people running nodes, like where they should look to configure the metrics correctly. If you can post it in the chat here, that would be super helpful. Um, sure, I can do an issue to write those. Sorry. I yeah we we will we will send the link. It's not ready now, uh, but I okay, can post awesome. it. Yeah, I can get something together too. Okay, great. Um, Sweet. Anything else on this big blog testing? Okay. Um, and yeah, if anyone wants to be on the Telegram group, just send me a, a message and I'll, I'll make sure to add Sorry, you. Tim, um, maybe one parting thought on, on this because I also have the job. Um, in general, I mentioned that in the chat, but we should have a very high bar and very rigorously defined metrics. And I don't want to sound like a broken record or like, you know, breaking the party, but we should have Again, I think we should ha we have a doc already. Let's have a doc which has the checklist of the things that we really need, and let's like focus on these things and work backwards towards making the benchmark successful. Um, ju just saying, this is a process point to kind of like minimize round trips and for us to make this kind of like, you know, we're doing this to to cover all the edge cases, and we should be prepared for the, all the edge cases. So I'd love to see like a more systematic approach, at least in the future. Yeah, I agree. And I think Danny, so I, I'm just looking over the changes Danny did. Um, so I think he's at least added since yesterday uh, a lot of the numbers we're looking at. So like, you know, uh, these, these like thresholds we want to make sure we're not exceeding. Um, so I think that's like a good place to start, but I agree we can we can probably refine it beyond that. Yeah. Um, and I guess, yeah, and, and probably the best way uh, also to frame this is like if client teams have specific numbers or thresholds or whatnot that they are concerned about. Um, this is, yeah. you know, I think the reason we're doing this is sort of to convince ourselves and, and all the client teams that this is sound. And so like, yeah. Exactly, it, it, every stakeholder in this yeah. has a feedback loop that needs to be surfaced. Yeah. And that feedback loop might be the latency, might be the CPU, the ingress, the egress, whatever. But it's like, ideally every client team would have like a list of like, here's what we need to be true for us to be okay with it. And then people work backwards. And they, uh, candidly, all of this may already exist, but you know, um, having it in one place as a single source of truth matters. Yeah. And you know, everybody having signed on it. Like ad hoc is good, but like, you know, you have to have things in one place. Anyway, sorry to rant. Yeah. No, hey, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. I happen to have a list Please. with all the metrics from all the consensus clients about block latency and attestation latency. I put it on the chat. Awesome, thanks. I'll I'll add this in Danny's doc as well. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Um, sweet. Anything else on this? Okay, 
Okay, uh, DevNet 3. Um, yeah, I'm curious how our different clients tracking. Do people still think launching uh, late next week makes sense? Um, yeah, no, Roberto, I see you just put your camera on, so I'll call on you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we need a little more momentum on the client side, to be honest. Um, the, the good news is, I guess, the, um, you know, the client API libraries are now pretty, pretty solid within Go, KZG, and CKZG. Um, has been work making sure they uh, interoperate nicely and, and uh, you know, barring the few edge cases and a few of the other um, details from the PRs that have been closed just, you know, over the past day, um, it's all working pretty well. Um, but as far as, you know, clients that are fully capable of interoperating, um, right now within that interop repo, it's just Dev, it's just Prism and um, Geth. Um, Loadstar, I think, is close. Um, I'd love to hear an update from from the team working on that, the folks working on that, if when it'll get there. Um, I myself am working on Aragon to get that up to snuff. Um, I haven't heard a lot about what's going on with some of the other clients still. Um, as far as Prism goes, like I think we still need the the, the version in the interop repo anyway. Um, needs needs a couple updates. One one being like I, I think right now it hasn't combined the beacon block and the sidecar in the same. Uh, together, it's still doing the decouple thing. So, so I'd, I'd love to hear an update on that as well. Um, but you know, those are kind of my updates. Okay, thanks. Alexa, uh, Alexa, oh, Alexa, uh, then the applied. Yeah, I kind of date on Lodestar. So, as of Friday, I would say optimistically, I completed the full implementation uh, of the current spec. I was able to run with the interop. Uh, post, post EIP for the fork, fork, propose blocks with blobs and retrieve them on the P2P. But it's not passing the interop because there is some weird protocol issue that I have to debug. I think the, the implementation of the P2P to consume and assert the tests have some incompatibility with us, uh, but working on it. Cool, great. Let me know if I can help. Is, is Mofi on the call? I'm wondering if we can get a prism. Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, I came out from the mind side. Uh, as for now, we have uh, like uh, then a three version compliant client, I believe, but uh, uh, with some bugs and uh, no withdrawals yet merged uh, like that. And uh, uh, the single question I have now is uh, um, how we uh, arrange um, the Docker Compose uh, with all the containers. Uh, do you guys uh, see uh, an idea to add the uh, beacon nodes uh, like uh, for uh, execution clients more beacon nodes? Or replace a guest uh, for followers or like that. Uh, uh, what will be in this file? Uh, we want to make a pull request, but uh, just wanted to clarify this question before. Like, what uh, will be a container set of uh, the network? Yeah. Uh, I'm <clears throat> sorry, I'm not sure I follow the question. Uh, yeah, uh, interop um, repository contains Docker Compose, which includes uh, beacon nodes uh, and uh, execution site validator and so on. And we now need to update, uh, uh, like, add our clients, right? Yeah. Eric, never mind. I believe uh, some uh, here uh, site clients. So. Um, should we um, just add uh, additional uh, beacon nodes uh, for uh, execution clients, or we can use uh, like uh, we can replace uh, guest as a, uh, a beacon which is in uh, the pair with uh, uh, one of followers like that. We want to, yeah. Any ideas? Or oh, it's still not clear. 
I mean, we 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 need uh, to be added to this network. And uh, what would your advice? Yeah, I think ultimately we want to have to be able, we want to be able to fire up kind of mixes and matches of execution clients and consensus clients. Um, you're right, though, the Docker files that are in there do not support that yet. So, um, you know, I think we're, 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 we're open to um, suggestions on how to, how to best do that. Um, I don't have any firm ideas myself. Um, um, so I think this is related to the testing discussion, which is also on the agenda. And in particular, something that Hive could support. And I will have some time next week to pick up more of the Hive testing. Uh, to get some diversity in the testing and also enable to swap clients more easily for testing now that we have more more um but maybe let's discuss async because i think mofi also likes to discuss this but he's sick and chat works better yeah but i think in the meantime before we sort of figure out a full general solution just submissions that are um you know fire up specific clients independently of the other ones, just to run them through our existing and end tests and make sure they pass would be really helpful. Uh, okay. Uh, so we will just make a PR just with uh, additional beacon nodes uh, of Lodster and uh, uh, Prism connected to our client and uh, I'll let you judge uh, what is uh, best way maybe any suggestions appear yeah thanks no more questions sounds great uh so for lighthouse i'd say we're maybe a day away from like our full initial implementation and then at that point um until the test net we'll just be working on testing it out trying to get it running um trying to get interop working so I think we'll be we'll be ready. Do you I want to squeeze uh, uh, different execution clients like that? Sorry, are you asking whether we plan to test with multiple execution clients? Yeah. Yeah, that would be the hope. I think initially. Um, We'll just start with one, but probably initially get, but then maybe another mine next. Okay. Um, just to clarify, are there any clients who have concerns about the cryptography or need stuff to be done there? Uh, we we can make it work in Lighthouse. There's just some inefficiencies, um, I think, for the time being, but that's okay. Um, yeah, an update from Teco on this because we started working on the Java binding. You might be interested also the the best team. So yeah, um, from the cryptography, I think we will have something in the coming days. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks. There have been concerns in the past around performance of the mempool during verification um, when many transactions arrive, and I wonder what the state of benchmarks there are, if any. I don't think we have any there, um, but yeah, I'd like to hear more about what the concerns are there. Well, I, th I think Moffitt did some benchmarks. It was like five milliseconds to verify the blobs of a transaction. Um, I don't know the entire transaction, but I think the cryptography part was five milliseconds. Uh, I, I know that also Antar has an argument on on why uh, we don't expect to see too many transactions under normal case on the mempool, but I don't know about, if you're wondering about malicious. What about in the existence of adversaries? What's up? Say that again. Sorry. 
I'm just asking a question to be clear. I don't have any opinions here, but um, what about, uh, I understand that in the happy case, yeah, there's going to be few blob transactions, it might be fine, but I would urge you guys to think what happens when an adversary spams, finds kind right. of like an optimal number of like transactions and abuses the fact that there's no batch verification done on a client. Right. I mean, I think, I think one, one thing to, 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 to consider here is that like um, the cryptography thing, like, I mean, even, even if the cryptography verification took one millisecond, I feel like, you know, it doesn't make a difference in adversarial scenarios, but uh, if it's one millisecond or five milliseconds or three milliseconds, you know, like it's in the same order of magnitude and hence it's still the same POS. So maybe, maybe put the question, maybe putting it in any very like more granular format. What, how does the attacker's cost profile look like when they try to abuse it? And if it's fine, it's fine. But like, that's the question, I guess. Like, can an attacker come up with a sequence of like blobs that like takes some time that makes it for MEV for whatever? I don't know, just asking. Right, so I, I think basically this is mostly a, a question about like, um, mempool uh, implementation, mempool logic. So um, now that we have disabled broadcast, I don't think it is a, like it, this is not a problem that can bring down a node anymore, at least if, if, if the client uh, is, is probably implemented and there's some, some um, throttling for requesting block transactions. But what it, what it could do is, of course, you could just, uh, if, if, if it's naively implemented, you can spam, spam a P and then the people would have to stop processing block transactions. So you could kind of bring down the, the blob, tra blob transaction propagation throughout the network. Um, and so things that can be done here, and maybe a question would be like, should we have a place to kind of talk about this, to specify this or something, or is it should that be up to clients? But what you could do is um, A, you can batch per peer verification, because if I, ideally you'd want to disconnect from a peer if even a single uh, verification fails. So you don't have to, you wouldn't have to do like, um, bifurcation to actually find out which of the transaction fails. You don't care if 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 they send in one invalid one, um, then that then that's it for for them. Um, and also, ideally, what you would have is you just have a per peer throttling, where basically you just you only don't, you only request you know five blob transactions per peer per slot or something. And if if you have some rudimentary logic like that, it should all be fine. Um, again, because it's up for clients to implement. This is not part of the IP or the specification. So I'm just wondering, should should there be some central place to discuss this or should there be just something left for clients to, to make calls on? Um, one thought here, Ansgar, and uh, I was rereading the IP yesterday, um, would be that just use some should, must, RFC logic or language. Um, I don't know, but it feels like some guidance should be given there because given the fact that we are having this conversation now and half the room kind of like went silent when I asked the question, makes me think that, you know, we haven't thought about that enough or maybe three people have thought about it. Or maybe it's not an issue and we can just like write it down somewhere, but it should be somewhere about the process. Right. Maybe maybe the best place would actually be as you were just saying, basically the the kind of the um, the uh, uh, rationale slash kind of backwards compatibility section of the of the EIP, where it's not it's not required specification, but it is um, advice for for client implementers. Yeah, and also in would the chat, be, Maris, would that be helpful? Maris just said something about the separate mempool. Also, this is the first time I see it. So again, there's a bunch of ideas, and it would be good to crystallize. Again, just in the best interest of the AP. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I think I think Asgar, what you what you propose makes sense. Like, um, if you can add something to the to the to the EIP, um, I can also link it in like the readiness checklist. And when Get has an implementation uh, for the for this separate transaction pool, we can also like reference it there. Um, I think the, the EIP should have at least a mention of it, but then we can track you know ways people deal with that somewhere else. Um, Right. Is there any value? I mean, I, what I can do is I can just, you know, whatever thoughts I have, I can just put them into the AP. Um, I'm always with this slightly worried because it's so much client implementation details that uh, it might just be something that's not re realist, a realistic approach for clients to take. So ideally, of course, there should be some sort of, I would be kind of happy about some sort of client feedback. Is there some avenue to take here to, to kind of 
get clients to talk about this or should I just put something in the AP to begin with and then we can talk about whether clients think that's that's reasonable. Right, and maybe there's a higher order bit here or conversation to be had around the feedback loops between the EIP process and client development. But I understand this is out of scope for this conversation. Yeah, so I, yeah, and, and I think let's let's add it to the EIP. We can obviously always discuss it on awkward devs, uh, you know, once once clients are like a bit farther along. But I think the, yeah, I, my feeling is probably a lot of the EL teams just are not even like that far yet. And so like, um, if it, it's in the EIP, at least we won't forget about it. It'll be there. Um, yeah. And then and then we, we can obviously discuss it on awkward apps or, or on Discord async, but it feels like beyond get, there's basically not a uh, a team that has like spent the time to to consider this very deeply. So, um, anything else on the DevNet? And obviously, yeah, I guess just to be like extremely clear, this is like solving this is not in scope for the DevNet 3, obviously. Um, yeah. Okay. I have um, clear I have clear status okay. updates on I was just gonna say I have clear status updates on all, all the Clients, which I think all the clients seem to, uh, that previously committed Lighthouse, Nethermind, Lodestar, Geth, and Aragon all seem on track for the DevNet, but I couldn't quite tell what the status was with Prism. Um, yeah, I, know I can give an update. Working on that. I don't know. Sorry, I can give an update. I'm also working on it as well. So I'm mostly done with the sync PPP changes. I think we are on track. I just before we start a DevNet, I do really want to run through the EIP 444 changes with the consensus layer spat test and then switch away on that just to make sure that we somehow align with consensus. So therefore we don't like just fail like right away. <laughs> we definitely do not want that. So yeah, we are on track. That's the TLDR. Okay. And that's, I guess this means Great. all the client teams that have previously committed are on track. Um, so next week, uh, we're going to have a call like a day before we were expecting to launch the DevNet. Um, ideally by then, I guess what's the thing we want? Yeah. By like next week, 24 hours before launching the DevNet, we should have like clear branches or PRs for every client. Um, and, and is it on every client to add themselves to this interrupt repo? Um, basically that's like the the thing we would expect or yeah what's i guess yeah i'm trying to get what's the what's the like product that we want out of client teams before we launch a devnet um i think we should do something fairly similar to like kintsugi or like Enfura. just have some the client tracking she was really useful and then maybe define some sort of like milestone base like m0 m1 m2 and then you keep and then you keep building on top of that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think that makes sense. I can I can put this together. Uh, I can put the hack and beat together, I think. And then, but then we're saying like the client teams, basically we just provide the Genesis file and um, we kind of do like Amphora where you check your interoperating, you know, it, it works and whatnot. And then uh, we can add some, I guess some boot notes in that file as well, so people know where to connect. But um, we're not, and, and and this means basically it's not going to be like a single Docker repo that just runs everything. But it's more like you know any team can connect to the DevNet with the right uh, right Genesis file and, and and peer settings. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put this together in the next couple of days, uh, just so we have this, um, yeah, this, this definite checklist. And uh, do we want, yeah, I, Tim, I did like your idea of, of putting every, of having everything in the interop repo as well. So I don't know, I is that, like yeah, I guess, milestone as well. Before we, is that better or worse? Because it feels like <laughs> it's, it might be better from like the perspective of, you know, it's tractable and we see where it is. Is it worse in that like it makes clients do all this config work um, that is not really realistic with how we actually run networks and also maybe ends up being kind of a crutch if like you can't run Prism separately? But I, 
I don't have a strong opinion there. Um, I mean, it's it provides that initial sanity check of, you know, is it going to sink right <laughs> with our other clients? So I guess yeah. If if you had to, if you so say we use this like milestone uh, approach, I assume it's easier for clients to have a branch that's compatible with the DevNet than to have that branch part of the interoperable, correct? Um, they sort of need the first to get the second. Yeah, which is fine. I mean, because the, the interrupt yes. repo is simply a, you know, it's a sub-module which we can point at any any branch. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll just so what I'll do, I'll just separate those out in the in the in the milestone stock. So you know, like the second, the last one is like have a branch that people can use to run on a DevNet, and then the last one is like have that branch tracked and part of the interop repo. Um, Sounds good. Cool. Um, and so yeah, and so I guess then. At the minimum, what we'd want for next Tuesday is everyone has like a branch that's working that follows the spec for DevNet 3. Um, and then ideally it's all in the interop repo in like one clean place. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, and we only have two minutes uh, to go. I guess the like next two were more of just like an announcement slash heads up. Um, but we have this, and, and on on Thursday we have an awkward dance where we want to talk about uh, Shanghai CFI. Um, oh, sorry, Xiaowei, I, I didn't see your hand. Uh, do you want to go first? Oh uh, yeah, just uh, in case yeah. that anyone doesn't didn't see the meeting chat. So uh, there's a bug in the test vectors that we re released uh, last Friday, um, but. I am generating the new test vectors and we will. Uh, publish it in 24 hours. That's not a spec changes, it's a bug in okay, the just fix. configuration, yeah. Okay, got it. Um, okay, great. And then, um, okay, sorry, what I was saying is, uh, there's all code devs this Thursday. We're gonna talk uh, about Shanghai's TFI lists. Uh, there's been a uh, formal proposal to add uh, 4844 as a CFI. Proto just put this on the awkward agenda. He posted an update also on ETH Magicians uh, and on GitHub about like the status of the EIP. Um, so I think that's that's pretty good. Like at least we can kind of present where things are at. Maybe the one thing where uh, it would be good to have an update is if there's any testing uh, tools or, or, or things we've worked on um, to kind of link those on the... Uh, readiness checklist. Um, and then the other part, maybe that would be good to, to, to have a sort of written update about is just the status of the different uh, bindings for uh, the KZG library. It, I believe every single client team is covered, um, but just being able to point to that, I think would be, would be valuable. Um, so people can kind of know uh, that they exist and, and, and that it's, it's supported, but yeah, anything, I guess, is there anything else people think we should try to like explain or or, 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 um, or, or kind of put together before Awkward Devs uh, on, on Thursday? Okay, if not, I guess this is a good place to end. Um, yeah, thanks a lot everyone um, and we'll chat with most of you uh, on Aqua Devs and otherwise uh, next week on this call to launch this DevNet. Cool. Thanks everyone. Thank awesome work. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.